Humans stand at the top of the food chain. So what creature do you think is our greatest adversary? Timothy Weingard is assistant professor of history at Colorado Mesa University, and his answer may surprise you. His new book says it all. It's titled, The Mosquito, A Human History of Our Deadliest Predator. And Timothy Weingard joins us now to explain. It's so nice to meet you. Yes, you too, thank you for I've just been me. telling you how awesome this book is. Are you surprised that a book about mosquitoes has been so well received by readers? Um, I, in a way, yes, it's been very surreal and, and quite the wild ride the last you know, four or five months with the reception the book's received. Um, but I think because it is nearly a, a global universal animal and they've been stalking human beings right from our ancestral evolution to present day, there's probably no one on the planet who at some point hasn't had a, a run-in with a mosquito, whether that's just an itchy, itchy bump and a scratch or maybe unfortunately one of the more than 15 um, deadly diseases that she, only females bite, uh, transmits. So I, I think the topic, given the, the mosquito climate lately as well, uh, was timely and it's a unique way to look at history through the lens of the mosquito and the impact that this tiny, tiny animal has had um, in influencing and shaping human history uh, across our existence. That is the most fascinating um, part about your book. And in your answer, you said stalking, and we're going to find out how the mosquito has been stalking us humans. Um, here's some uh, statistics about mosquitoes. Uh, there are 110 trillion mosquitoes in the world. They have killed an estimated 52 billion people from the 108 billion people that have ever lived. Since the year 2000, mosquitoes have killed an average of 2 million people a year, except in 2018 when it was 830,000 people. Uh, they can now transmit 15 different diseases to humans, up from about six in 1930. Um, you're a historian. What got you interested in the mosquito? Um, again, it is first and foremost a history book. Obviously, there's some science mixed in there about the, the animal itself and, and, and what she does and how she does it. Um, I look at history as a puzzle, and slowly I started collecting, I guess, more pieces metaphorically, if you will, on the table. And I had been familiar with mosquito-borne diseases, specifically malaria and yellow fever, uh, in researching for some of my previous book, books, which uh, delve into indigenous peoples of the Americas, but global indigenous peoples as well, as well as some military history. So I was familiar with certain episodes of, of malaria and yellow fever specifically. Um, and I finished my fourth book, and as customary, my dad, who's a, an emergency physician in Sarnia, we always sit down and brainstorm, and he said, you have to do something on disease. And he threw out malaria, and we started talking, and I started getting into the research and slowly started putting more puzzle pieces together on the table, and eventually a very clear picture emerged that just how devastating and historically influential this animal has been to uh, human history across the planet. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that it's the female mosquito that does this, does does the damage, right? Yes, only females bite, um, and it's it's hardwired into, into them. They're just trying to be good moms, so don't blame the mosquito. <laughs> yeah. uh, they need blood from humans and a host of a zoological Noah's Ark of other animals uh, to grow and mature their eggs. It's that simple. Uh, so what type of illnesses can we get from mosquitoes? Um, there's over 15 um, different pathogens that can easily be divided up into three categories. Uh, worms, mm -hmm. it, 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 so phyloriasis, often mistakenly called elephantiasis, it's actually elephantiasis, but where you get the engorged limbs and genitals from worms blocking the lymphatic system. Mm -hmm. Um, that's one. Um, the virus class is the biggest, which contains yellow fever, dengue, chikungunya, West Nile, Zika, Eastern equine encephalitis, Venezuelan encephalitis. There's a whole host of viruses. And then the most deadly is obviously malaria, which is in a, a category by itself, which is a very unique plasmodium uh, protozoan parasite. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's in its own category. And it has been primarily the, the killer of human beings across our existence. So I mentioned at the top that um, back in 1930, we had uh, six different diseases to humans. Now it's 15. Um, why the change? Um, I think we're seeing an increase in what they call zoonotic diseases, which is, or animal spillover diseases. Now, a lot of our diseases, whether it's smallpox, tuberculosis, come from uh, bird flu, swine flu, come from animal, different animals. So 
we're seeing an increase in mosquito-borne diseases primarily coming from other, um, the great apes or monkeys. Um, there's five kinds of mala human malaria parasites and the most recent one, Nalesi, just made the jump from a macaque monkey in Southeast Asia mm -hmm. to humans. Um, the viruses, so Westna, for example, is birds. Birds are a reservoir of diseases, including mosquito-borne disease. So I think either they are mutated in new viruses or we're finally identifying viruses that have been around for a while, but we're finally putting our finger on them. And you also make a point in the book to say that mosquitoes are very um, adaptable. And that's probably why we have a hard time dealing with them. Um, both the mosquito itself and also the pathogens, like any other creature, mm -hmm. they want to survive and procreate. That's their job. Um, no different from, from human beings. Mm -hmm. So um, their survival instincts um, take over and they are remarkable um, creatures of evolution, uh, specifically the mosquito and the malaria parasite, they evolve and adapt to our, our best frontline weapons, which is why malaria is still such a huge killer um, to this day. So they are remarkable. And I, and I always say, if the mosquito didn't cause so much death, disease, and suffering, we might actually acknowledge how um, much of a remarkable creature that this tiny little animal is because it is a fascinating, um, fascinating animal. Mm -hmm. Can I still hate it though? Yes. Um, <laughs> I just want to show you, a bit, well, not hate, hate's a strong word. Um, I actually got uh, malaria uh, uh, in 2007. Uh, I'll show you a picture. Uh, this is me um, in the hospital oh, wow. in Sierra Leone. Yeah. And there's another picture, uh, that's me on the way to the hospital. Um, and when I first got it, I was like, oh, I've had malaria before, I'm fine. But then I ended up getting the falci falciparum, yep, um, falciparum. Uh, yep. uh, and it turned out to be really bad. So when yep. you get malaria, what happens to your body? Um, well, there's, as I said, five different human types of malaria. Uh, the great apes all have their own malarias, amphibians, reptiles. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a, a it nearly, it's an interesting. Sophisticated. Yeah, it is very sophisticated. As I said, it wants to live and find as many hosts as it can. Mm -hmm. um, the the um, falciparum malaria is the worst or most deadly of the five human types of malaria. Vivax is the most common, um, but essentially, the parasite invades your, um, in, in your blood and it goes directly to your liver and hibernates and reproduces and then comes out of your liver and bursts in your, in your blood to feed on the hemoglobin. Um, and then it has a seven stage reproductive cycle, which is very sophisticated, some of which takes place in humans, some of which takes place in mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. So they need both a human and a mosquito to continue this reproductive cycle, malaria parasites do. So it's a remarkable, mm -hmm. um, remarkable, I mean, creature uh, in itself. So you go through, depending on what type of malaria you have, there's different uh, cyclical rhythms of uh, fever, sweats, chills, fever, sweats, chills. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, you know, roughly 90% of malaria deaths are children under five because their immune systems just can't handle um, the overload of the parasite. So eventually you go into a coma um, and have cerebral malaria and, and die. That's what I had. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's horrible. Um, are certain people predisposed to being, to being bitten by mosquitoes? Yes. There is, yeah. <laughs> they, they bite everybody, and I need to say that, but um, she does play favorites, um, and there's a lot of mythology about, you know, people getting bitten more than other people. Um, so, for example, hair color has nothing to do with it. They, they don't prefer blondes and redheads over people with darker hair. They don't prefer females over males, another myth. They don't prefer, you know, if your skin is darker, more leathery, you don't get bitten as much. That's a perfume? Not, yeah, that's not true either. Uh, blood type has a lot to do with it. Blood type O, uh, the research is saying, gets bitten tw twice as much as blood type A, with type B falling in between. Um, the amount of chemicals and bacteria in and on your skin, specifically lactic acid, mm -hmm. uh, the amount of carbon dioxide that um, is, ex is ex exhaled by a person, uh, how stinky your feet are. Stinky feet are an aphrodisiac to mosquitoes. So have a shower. Um, <laughs> well, actually, stinky here is good. Uh, stinky here, wash your feet. But applied fragrances can attract them. Uh, bright clothes, um, beer drinkers. 
So there's a whole host of things, but at the end of the day, about 85% of what makes you more alluring or less alluring to mosquitoes is pre-hardwired in your genetic circuit board. So unless you want to CRISPR yourself with the newfangled gene editing technology, mm -hmm. you can't do much about it. We're going to talk about CRISPR in a moment, <laughs> um, but I wanted to read something that you wrote uh, for, uh, in the Globe and Mail. In 1984, the buzzing town of Comarno, Manitoba, located roughly 70 kilometers north of Winnipeg, did just that, embracing its reputation. Its name means mosquito infested in Ukrainian. The town proudly erected a menacing 15 foot tall statue of a mosquito with a wingspan approaching 17 feet, the largest mosquito on the planet. While Komano's title as the mosquito mecca is unofficial, Canada garrisons the largest national contingent of the 100 trillion or more mosquitoes circling almost every inch of the globe. As a country, we are, quite literally, the mosquito capital of the world. That is shocking. I would think that there are more mosquitoes in tropical places. How is it that Canada is the mosquito capital of the world? Well, one, we're just such a large country. And we're um, showing that giant <laughs> mosquito over there. <laughs> the mosquito in Camarno. Yeah. Uh, Landmass-wise, we're just such a large country. And also, we have the most fresh water in the world. So mosquitoes lay their eggs in, in water. So it, it makes sense just based on geography and the amount of water, lakes, rivers we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the Arctic. The Arctic, are uh, at certain times of the year, are swarming with mosquitoes. Um, they literally bleed young caribou to death at a bite rate of 9,000 per minute. Um, so I don't suggest sticking your arm. Is that what, in the book you said yeah. that that's like draining a human being in two hours or something? Uh, half like the blood from an adult human in roughly two hours if uh, at that bite rate. So that's incredible. So. Um, Thankfully, we don't have many of the specific disease carriers. Now, it's important for people to know that there's roughly 3,500, give or take, species of mosquitoes on the planet, um, and very few of them actually are able to vector or transmit these pathogens. So not all mosquitoes are disease, disease vectors. It's select species of mosquitoes, specifically the Anopheles, um, 80s and Culex mosquitoes. Now we have the Culex here and that's West Nile. Um, so the 80s Egypti is the one that people are worrying about expanding its range um, with global warming. And that is the, the, the vector for most of those viruses that I had talked about and mentioned earlier. Because it's getting warmer. Right, so it's expanding its range both north and south away from the equator, but also into higher altitude as well. So I think we'll get into global warming later, but there are there is a concern with that specific mosquito species. So when we get to eradication, um, it, it, nobody is promoting the eradication of all mosquitoes off the face of the planet because not all mosquitoes transmit or vector disease. So it would be targeting these very select species for, for eradication, the Aedes aegypti being one. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any place on earth that is free of mosquitoes? Iceland, Antarctica, uh, for now, although I was talking from an entomologist um, from, from the UK on the BBC um, about a month ago, mm -hmm. and there's questions as to whether with global warming mosquitoes are already penetrating into Antarctica, but we don't think so yet. Uh, there's some midges there actually that they just found that shouldn't be there, mm -hmm. but um, so Iceland, Antarctica, and a few, you know a handful of very, very, very small islands in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you, so as you write that you know the pathogens of uh, these diseases adapt, mosquitoes adapt. You also write about human adaptation and you um, w how we developed or certain people developed uh, sickle cell. How did some people develop sickle cell? Um, it goes back to agriculture, um, as a lot of things do with, with disease. The agriculture that led to the rise of civilization, if you will, um, across the world. There's, they think, roughly 12 independent sites of agricultural origin uh, across the planet, including the Americas. Um, so agriculture leads to um, denser populations, which, and also we add beasts of burden and domesticate animals, which as I said, it's that zoonotic transfer of these diseases from animals to human. They make the jump, uh, if you will. So Bantu farmers started clearing um, land in Africa to plant um, yams and plantains, and it released essentially, or they came face to face with falciparum malaria. So our blood cells are obviously rounded, oval shaped, mm -hmm. 
and the, the malaria parasite latches on, gets inside, reproduces, feeds on the hemoglobin. Um, the crescent-shaped or sickle-shaped blood cells, um, the, the, the parasite is fooled and it doesn't know how to, oh, I can't figure this out, to get, to, to, to get it. inside. Yeah, right. um, so it prevents the malaria parasite from reproducing and it, and it, and it, it dies. So uh, the problem is, is that sickle cell is both a killer and a savior. Before modern medicine, um, if you inherit sickle cell from both parents, which is sickle cell disease, you b wouldn't survive childhood. Mm -hmm. um, if you get sickle cell from one parent but not the other sickle cell trait, you would live to an average age of roughly 21, mm -hmm. which is horrible, but long enough to reproduce and carry on the human species. Right. So it's a very rushed and imperfect um, natural selective evolutionary response to falsip falciparum malaria um, because it again it, it does kill but at least you pass on um, sickle cell to keep you know procreating uh, our, our species so it, it is quite um, amazing but it also attests to the fact that it must have been cataclysmic rates of malaria in order for in, that in to happen part of Africa mm -hmm. for that to happen and to happen so quickly quickly as well. You write about the concept of seasoning uh, to adapt to mosquito-borne illness. Is that part of it? Yes, seasoning is the term that the, the British used during the period of, of colonization, imperialism. Um, essentially, and I don't suggest this as a, an inoculation strategy, but the more you suffer, the less you suffer in a way with repeated malarial infections. So you start to develop some immunity. It's not immunity like a vaccine, for example. Malaria is not a virus in the traditional or classical sense. Um, so you start to develop uh, a bit of immunity so you get less sick and the chances of dying get less likely with repeat infections of, of malaria and that's called seasoning, mm -hmm. which is very important in, in the historical context when we look at specific wars where you have outside invaders who aren't seasoned coming somewhere as foreigners to fight and fighting people or armies who are already seasoned to malaria. And the best case of that would certainly be the American Revolution, where these British soldiers come from Northern England and Scotland and are shoved into the Carolinas during the final couple years of the American Revolution and are cut to pieces by malaria, whereas the American colonists were seasoned to their own blend of malaria in the colonies. In the book, you know, we spend $11 billion US uh, every year trying to ward off mosquitoes. Which defenses have worked? Staying in at dusk. <laughs> that simple? Yeah, I mean, we've all, we try the tents and, you know, bed nets do work and, and they are saving lives where, mm -hmm. where they're used properly. Um, but the bottom line is we've all doused ourselves in deet and off and backwoods or whatever all these mm -hmm. uh, repellents are called. But if you miss a spot, and we've all done this too, they, they find it and they're, they're, you know, they're hardwired to do that. They need that blood to, to be good mums and grow and, and mature their eggs. And, and it's important, again, mosquitoes by themselves are harmless. Um, you would still sure. get you would still get <laughs> bitten, you would still get maybe a little itchy bump, but that would be the end of it. Right. It's, and mosquitoes don't know they're causing all this death, disease, and, and, and destruction. Um, they're trying it, to survive. Right, it's the pathogens that are vectored or hitch a free ride, the hitchhikers through the mosquito that are the problem. So the pathogens are the killers, not necessarily that mosquito itself, but you can't have one without the other uh, in this case. Can you quickly explain how um, mosquitoes can't transfer HIV? There's no blood exchange during a mosquito bite. So people, when HIV first, you know, kind of s surfaced as a, as a disease, everyone was scared you could try to get HIV from a mosquito bite. It's just simply not possible with the biological workings of a mosquito and the HIV, vi the, the, the virus itself right now. So the virus could mutate essentially, maybe to be passed on through a mosquito, but right now it's not possible. So when a mosquito bites, think of it as having, uh, has six needles. Mm -hmm. So the first two think of, of an electric carving knife you use at Thanksgiving and it's these serrated, two serrated needles that saw back and forth into your skin while two other needles go in and act as um, retractors to hold open the puncture site. A fifth needle goes in, which is the straw, which sucks the blood. At the same time, the sixth needle goes in, mm -hmm. which injects saliva, which has an anticoagulant to prevent the you know, blood clotting at the site and also has a little numbing effect so you don't notice her biting. Mm -hmm. Through the saliva, 
is where these pathogens are transferred through, um, through that tube. So they're totally separate. The blood intake and the saliva tube are totally that's separate. So in, that's so interesting. It's a fascinating... Within a se like seconds, right? Because yes, until you feel the mosquito. It's a fascinating and sophisticated yeah. uh, feeding ritual. Um, and again, as I say, um, if she, did, she didn't cause so much disease, again, we'd be fascinated, but I am fascinated by this animal and how there's close-up videos you can watch online that go very PBS in depth that mm -hmm. show this, and it is amazing. Um, well, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has invested um, a staggering $4 billion in the past 20 years to eradicate mosquito-borne illness, well, well to try. Um, how has that money been spent in that time? Um, there's lots of different avenues that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funds specifically to target malaria, but also other mosquito-borne diseases and other diseases for that matter. Um, they have a whole host of different avenues where they, they, they put their philanthropic endeavors from agriculture to education mm -hmm. to the mosquito, specifically malaria. So there's two avenues essentially to look at mosquito-borne disease. Do you, do you go after the mosquito species itself, mm -hmm. thereby bringing down that, that pathogen, or do you go after the pathogen itself, or do you go after both? And I liken it to the military. When you go into war, you don't go into war with one weapon system. And you say, well, we're just going to send the Air Force in. Mm -hmm. No, you have multi-weapon systems for different jobs and different purposes, so perhaps uh, a wider front mm -hmm. to combat mosquito-borne disease, both with the mosquito and the pathogens, is the, the solution. And that's where the money is going. It's, it's a variety of, of efforts that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are funding. Because so far, with the mosquito-borne uh, illnesses, the only vaccine we have is for yellow fever, correct? Correct. It was developed by a South African-American in the uh, 1930s. Um, for the yellow fever virus, but even with the yellow fever um, vaccine, anywhere from 25 to 40,000 people a year still die of yellow fever. Um, but it is the only one currently that has a vaccine, and, and, and um, you know they're working on other vaccines for those virus classes as well because we're seeing a reemergence in some of those viruses, specifically dengue, mm -hmm. um, is making a huge comeback. I read somewhere uh, a few weeks ago that there's roughly 7.7 .7 or 7.8 billion people on the planet right now, mm -hmm. and that 4 billion are at risk from dengue alone. That excludes all the other mosquito-borne diseases. It was shocking. Well, in the book, you say that while malarial deaths are declining, um, other mosquito-borne illnesses are rising. Right. Why is that? So in part due to the efforts of the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization, and numerous other philanthropic and national um, organizations, governments. Um, so we're seeing a decrease in malarial rates and deaths every year. Um, which is a great thing because it is the paramount killer. So on one hand, that's fantastic and that's great news. But on the other hand, what we're seeing is an emergence or re-emergence of other mosquito-borne diseases, specifically that virus class. So we're seeing a huge increase in, in dengue, uh, chikungunya, Zika, obviously, West Nile. Now, thankfully, these aren't the prolific um, killers that mm -hmm. malaria is. I mean, they still can kill and people get awful sick and it, it's horrible, but um, so it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. So yes, malaria is being reduced annually, but we're seeing an emergence or re-emergence of other mm -hmm. mosquito-borne diseases. Um, and um, so it's, it's a bit of a give and take. Uh, you've mentioned CRISPR technology and that allows for gene editing and it's been tried on mosquitoes. Um, you said it hasn't worked. Um, do you think there are moral and ethical blind spots when it comes to using CRISPR technology? Oh, it is, I mean, it's been all over the news since it was, you know, discovered in, in recently in 2012. Can you explain first how CRISPR works? So, I mean, again, I'm a historian, but yeah. basically what we can do now um, with CRISPR research is, or CRISPR technology is remove an undesirable gene and replace it with a desired one, cheap, easily, mm. free will. It is permanently, it is, and those, that gene will then be, create what they call a gene drive, which will be passed on down the bloodlines, pardon the pun. Mm. So it is, it is fascinating, and we think about Jurassic Park, well, so as long as you have viable DNA, you can also use CRISPR to bring back species. So Jurassic Park is, uh, 
is real. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we use all this science fiction or Gattaca, all these movies, we, this is, is possible now. Mm -hmm. um, so from a mosquito standpoint, keep in mind again that there's very select few mosquito species that trans transmit or vector these pathogens. So nobody is promoting uh, the eradication of mosquitoes from the face of the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's targeting these, there's two avenues one with CRISPR. Um, one is to CRISPR, mosquitoes in a lab with a gene drive, uh, release them into the wild, uh, thereby well, procreating, producing stillborn or male offspring, bringing down that mosquito species eventually and that pathogen. The other one is to CRISPR mosquitoes with a gene drive that will be passed down their bloodlines to simply make the, mos the, the mosquito harmless by making them incapable of actually vectoring or transferring those pathogens. Mm -hmm. They're also using bacteria to try to do the same thing um, in mosquitoes. So um, it, it is a wonderful technology, um, but it's certainly opening Pandora's box mm -hmm. uh, as well. The ripple effects might be Human beings are inherently flawed and our mistakes can lead to a butterfly effect or whatever you, you, you want to call that. So mm -hmm. the important thing is that the international community who's dealing with this science and this technology, which certainly isn't me, I'm a historian, but they're asking these questions and they're asking the right questions about the ethical and moral dilemmas of, of using CRISPR. And I'm a huge Star Wars fan, so I just think of the clone armies you could create with uh, CRISPR technology. Now we're not quite there. Um, and, and so far they're having some success in the laboratories um, with these CRISPR mosquitoes and we're not sure how that will transfer out into the, to the real world, if you will, with, with these designer mosquitoes. Um, how has climate change affected the mosquito population around the world? Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're, climate change is a, is a worry um, when looking at mis these specific mosquito species and, and their ability to transmit these pathogens. Um, Canada, for example, in the last 20 years has seen a 10% increase in mosquito-borne disease. Um, specifically, that's West Nile, but also some newcomers, snowshoe hair virus, um, Jamestown Canyon virus, which are more benign cousins, if you will, of, of West Nile. But what we're seeing is invasive species um, coming into Canada, specifically Southern Ontario, the Great Lakes region, and the St. Lawrence River Valley. Um, and we're worried again that that Aedes aegypti, which has the ability to vector so many of those viruses, will, will make its way into Canada. From a U.S. context, what we're seeing is domestic, not traveler cases of dengue or malaria. We're seeing domestically transmitted cases of chikungunya and dengue, specifically in Florida and Texas, as well as Zika and West Nile. So if the right mosquito species are there and the pathogen is introduced to those mosquito species, they will start to vector that pathogen to the, to the human population. So it is a worry and it is certainly something that the international community is monitoring and, and keeping track of. Uh, with global warming, they'll be able to expand their range to be able to live and breed, um, you know, moving away from the equator, or in our case, p pushing the northern limit, northern limit line um, into southern Canada, as well as into higher altitudes. Um, Timothy, well, we've only just scratched the surface. <laughs> get it. Oh, um, you're going to come back. I did get it. <laughs> you're going to be back. I was waiting for that actually. I'm like, which, which I, worked till, I, I worked really hard. <laughs> um, you're going to be back on the show in the summer um, because there's so much to talk about in this book and we didn't have enough time to do it. So you'll be back to talk more. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you so you. much for your of time. Course. We Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you very much. Uh, that is uh, Timothy Weingard, the author of The Mosquito, A Human History of Our Deadliest Predator. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.